All right, I will uh, get started uh, without him. So, um, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, can we go to the agenda? Yeah. So um, today we'll cover, um, you know, some announcements. Um, we have some information from Cheryl about the end user community. Um, we have an <coughs> incubation review, an annual review from um, OPA since it's about its one year uh, anniversary since entering the sandbox. Um, we have a discussion topic around the CNF testbed that was announced recently. Um, and then we'll go over uh, CNCF uh, SIG. So let's kind of uh, speed through this. So yeah, um, awesome. Congratulations to the Container D folks for recently graduating. I think it's a fantastic project and uh, it's great to have our fifth project um, at the graduated maturity level. So thank you um, very much. Next slide. Uh, just uh, some reminders here. Uh, we push back the uh, talk notification acceptances for KubeCon uh, Europe to 3.11. So I believe that's next um, Monday. Uh, everyone should get their notifications uh, on that. So uh, sorry for the slight delay. Um, next slide. Uh, final kind of announcement for Summer of Code uh, uh, for CNCF. We have a lot of um, awesome project ideas out there. So if your project is interested in participating, please just send a pull request and um, add your uh, idea there. So we have a, a good uptake and we were formally also accepted into the program um, this year again. So that's, that's awesome news. Next slide. Um, uh, <clears throat> so this is one topic that we've uh, discussed in the past around um, having time for project presentations, um, uh, you know, in addition to kind of the normal TOC meetings that we have. So uh, I believe Quinton uh, suggested this uh, a while ago uh, and we're going to be implementing it now that every second Tuesday of the month will be dedicated to, um, at the same time uh, as this meeting will be dedicated uh, to project presentations. The goal is to do about two at a time to kind of work through the backlog. Um, the Creo folks have volunteered to uh, go uh, first at the meeting next Tuesday, uh, and I'm looking for one other project uh, that I'll shoot a note out uh, on the mailing list to, to ask for um, a volunteer. Anyone have any questions uh, on this or any comments uh, on the TOC? Cool. I'll take silence as acceptance. Cool. Moving on. So how are we gonna how are we, how are we gonna manage the schedule for that? Uh, so you know, but honestly, I like first you know first come first serve is basically my policy for folks who reach out, and and we'll kind of go there. If if it gets crazy, then um, you know maybe based on when they file the GitHub issue. Go ahead. Cool. All right. Um, sorry, maybe I can just speak on Brian's behalf. I think he had a concern that uh, we need to sort of prioritize some of these things depending on what the state of the backlog is. That we should perhaps have some prioritization function. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly the backlog looks like at the moment and if we can clear it fast enough that the prioritization is sort of academic okay. uh, or, or whether we want to try and do something more prioritizing than that. I'll, you know, how about this? I could kick off a discussion privately with the TOC and, and you kind of make that um, decision, okay? Yeah, I was gonna good feel like there's a huge backlog still. I know I have at least two projects. So you probably knew I was going to speak up that are waiting. Um, <laughs> thanks. All right. Thanks, Aaron. All right. I'm um, going to go throw it over to Cheryl to talk a little bit uh, about uh, end user updates and all that jazz. You there? Thanks, Chris. Okay, yes, cool. I'm here. Um, so first off, case studies. So I would like every non-sandbox CNCF project to publish a case study in the course of this year. Um, this is a one hour interview. If you represent a project, then I would really love if you could sign up at that link there to do this case study and it will be over the phone. You get full approval on it before it gets published. Um, note that these case studies are only for end users. So if you look at the list of case studies published on the CNCF website, you can see what kind of companies and organizations we're looking for from there. Next, please. Uh, the second request I have of the projects and the Kubernetes SIG leads is that they come and actually meet the end user community. And if you have questions to ask, then you can have a 30 minute time slot with the 80, 78 companies of the end user community. 
So we've already scheduled a handful of projects and a couple of the SIGs, but, and actually the TOC is very welcome as well to come and ask questions to the end user community. So this is a really good opportunity for you to actually gather requirements and meet the end users directly. So again, sign up link right there. Back to you, Chris. All right, <clears throat> so SIGs. Um, I know. have a quick question for, for Cheryl. Um, have you been coordinating with um, uh, SIG Contribax? And like I know from the steering committee's point of view uh, with Kubernetes, we've established a new user group type of organizi organizing structure. And it might be worthwhile to try and, and connect the dots between the outreach things that we've done within the Kubernetes community and the efforts across the, the CNCF. Yeah, um, I opened it direct, opened it up directly, and the Contribuex sync just signed up directly. Okay. Um, so I haven't coordinated any further than that, but I would be very happy to chat after this with you, Joe, and figure out yeah, how we can make sure these. At least get you talking with the right folks. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That would be great. Hey, hey, Joe. Um, before you joined the TOC. Um, I was trying to kick off a uh, financial services and user CNCF thing, um, which Cheryl and I have been working on. And uh, we just found out in the last 24 hours that it sounds like uh, you and some, some of the sim similar people have been trying to get something off the ground as well. So we should join forces on that. Yeah, the Kubernetes stuff is more like um, trying to separate out, say, for example, the 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 cloud provider SIGs, which are focused on implementation versus sort of user support and community types of things. So it's more sort of technology, maybe sort of horizontally focused versus something like a like a financial services would definitely be, I don't know whether it'd be vertical, or but it's a different axis, <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> okay. Cool, Go I don't wanna to take too much time. I just wanna make sure we connect the dots there. Another brief yeah. comment there, I don't know if you've, um, discussed some of the uh, scalability issues that Kubernetes has been having with these end user groups, uh, the Slack stuff being one of them. Is that something we also need to hook those two groups together on or? Um, I'm not quite sure I get what you mean. Uh, the well, possibly, although Quentin, the last time we discussed this, um, the CNCF unfortunately wasn't interested in helping with moderation. Um, so it might not be. Uh, I wasn't suggesting that they provide moderators. I was suggesting they try and help solve the problem in a different way, which seems to be a desire. Maybe, aspects. yeah, I wasn't sure. I guess I wasn't sure in that message about whether it was like, we're not supplying moderators or we're not, you know, engaged. I, 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 it's a good idea okay. to try and investigate. So, for sure. so context for folks, we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with a certain level of abuse and code of conduct stuff with respect to the Kubernetes Slack. And, uh, and a lot of this is trying to actually create the right forms for contributors versus w a wider community. And we don't have a good solution there. <laughs> it's a really hard problem. And so this is sort of completing a conversation that's already in, in progress around that. Yeah, so if you look in chat, so um, we actually did speak with the end user community uh, last week about the Slack moderation for Kubernetes Slack. And the, what the end user community thought at that point was that they would rather move to Reddit or move to another tool that was better suited for user support and community support rather than um, try and find the necessary number of moderators from the end user community to, uh, to manage it. But that's the sort of forum, that's the sort of questions that I would like you to be able to ask directly to end users. And Jace could probably add some color to, to that conversation too, if you'd like. Yeah, so I will say that there wasn't wide representation. There's probably about five different people from end user community, so it was not a scientific study by any means. It would be nice to actually get a wider group of people to weigh in on it and maybe frame the argument so it's a little better. Um, uh, and just to understand what the needs are there. Um, but Cheryl was extremely helpful, did a short uh, short notice meeting. And yeah, so I think it's more just solutioning at this point and, uh, and we're working on what that might look like uh, in the community. Awesome, cool. Thank you, Cheryl. Any, any, anything else? Or are we good with our end user? No, that's it for now. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so uh, off to the topic of SIGs, so you know we've been discussing this for, for a long time and, and last week we're 
kind of very close to finalization. Uh, there were some kind of final uh, comments, uh, I think, uh, in, in the pull request that Quinton's been doing a good job of um, addressing with others. So, uh, you know, Quinton, do you have any, you know, comments uh, here? Otherwise, I suggest we kind of formally uh, go for a vote and, and get this thing um, uh, done. Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable if we, if we give a vote. Um, I think the only two items that I'm aware of that are not fully resolved yet are whether to split some of those SIGs now or later. Um, and I have kind of been uh, motivating us to try and split them later once they're actually formed and once we know that space a little better. Um, but if there is general, if the TOC feels that they would rather split them today, uh, we can do that. Uh, one of the problems is we don't really have a good agreement on exactly along which seam to split them, which is one of the reasons why I thought it might be better to split them later. But that that's one not 100% resolved area. Um, and what was the other one? Oh, the other one was the nature of, of the control control structure between the TOC and these uh, SIGs and to what extent the TOC uh, has, you know, uh, active engagement and control of these SIGs versus them being more autonomous. Um, and the wording in the document is fairly clearly that they are under the control of the TOC, but there were some uh, comments that they perhaps should be more autonomous um, than that. Uh, I think those are the two only, the only two unresolved issues. That I'm, and, and there are a couple of you know formatting issues and more minor things, um, but those are the two items that I'm aware of that have not been totally resolved yet. But I do think that we can vote on the current state and I think we have reasonable uh, resolution paths for both of those issues going forward. Yeah, I think we can probably go ahead with starting to set up SIGs without necessarily having a final 1.0 charter for those. How are they going to work? Um, I think we could spend quite a long time arguing about the, the, the detailed language in the proposal if we really want, wanted to. But I think the, the intent is clear, and I think we should be soliciting leadership for those SIGs right away. I agree. Um, I would like the TOC members themselves to to vote on that though and say yes, that is the plan. It's in what's in the document is the plan, and we're executing it, uh, as opposed to we haven't agreed on what the plan is. <laughs> so to do that, we probably want to have a target a, a target date which might slip for a 1.0 document that we're going to vote on, um, and then initiate the process of um, soliciting leadership and for exact SIGs. Um, right? So to do that, somebody needs to basically put together language that we can vote on proposing something like that. I'm happy to put together some, <clears throat> some language and kick off a formal vote. Um, we could put a deadline on maybe this Friday for final, final comments. So I, I, I thought that deadline was today, basically, and that we could kick off the vote today. Or, or do we think that the proposal is not sufficiently detail to vote on. I'm not totally clear on what we're saying. I think in the past we've, we've solicited objections from TOC members on the call and indeed from the wider community to, to what's being proposed and if there isn't a you know a loud vocal objection then we then basically articulate the vote immediately. I think we solicited that two weeks ago uh, okay. Wrong, and and decided that well, we would I wasn't here two weeks ago, so apologies. <laughs> okay. It's kind okay. of like a final, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to nitpick about it, but I, I think we've done all of that, and we, we should okay. just vote. Great. I'm in favor of moving forward personally, but um, okay. other people think. There are no strong objections. I'm, I'm happy to put something other to get <clears throat> something together today and, and, and send it out. Uh, I think last time we also discussed to bootstrap, uh, you know, with one SIG first to kind of test drive things to see uh, how it works before adding uh, a ton more SIGs. And I think we suggested maybe that governance or safe kind of one and being the, the first one. 
Yeah, I think that there are a couple there that are uh, important for different reasons. Um, but yeah, I'll start with one and move from there as fast as possible. I think as soon as we start soliciting people who want to push these things forward, we'll find that there is momentum in certain areas. All right. Thanks, Chris. I consider that done. So uh, moving on to the next slides, which I believe it's uh, Torin uh, to talk about uh, OPA. Um, you know, it's been about almost a year since they've entered the sandbox, so they're due for their uh, annual review for the TOC. And also, um, this is co you know coinciding with them requesting to move to the incubation level too. So I will let uh, I think Torin should be on. You there? Hello. Or Tim presenting. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, we hear you now. Okay, sorry, we were dialed in and then uh, I guess that was automatically muted or something. Okay, no, no I think it's like star six to, to unmute if you're done. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. All right, go ahead, it's, it's all yours now. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Torin. I'm one of the, the co-founders and core contributors to the Open Policy Agent. Um, so uh, what we thought we'd do is just give a quick overview of the project uh, before we dive into to some of the, the progress we've made. Um, so Open Policy Agent, or uh, OPA, is a uh, general purpose policy engine. And um, what that means is that it basically provides uh, a building block, a reusable building block um, that you can take um, and use to unify policy enforcement across uh, a range of different technology. So. The, the, the whole goal of OPA is to help um, different kinds of components in your stack uh, enforce policies, right? So whether you're talking about the API server or a custom internal microservice or a CI CD pipeline or an object gateway or something like that, um, OPA exists to fill the gap of enforcing, you know, authorization policy or policies within that, that component. Um, and so today, uh, folks are using OPA for a variety of different use cases. Um, the two main ones, though, are around API authorization um, in microservice environments. And uh, the second one is around admission control within Kubernetes. Um, so there are a number of different people using OPA for API authorization. Um, we typically break that down into kind of um, two categories. So there are companies like Netflix that are using OPA for um, building out like an internal security platform to enforce authorization over like internal uh, services and internal resources. Um, and then there are companies that are embedding OPA uh, as a basically as a, as a library to implement authorization for their end users, right? So every time, you know, a, a, an enterprise software company ships software to their customers, they have to have some kind of authorization system in place, right? And so they, they expose role-based access control or an IAM style um, system to their end users. And what we've seen in the last year or so is a lot of growth in terms of the number of companies just basically offloading that, uh, that, that implementation to OPA. Um, on, the, on the Kubernetes side, um, admission control side specifically, we see tons of companies using OPA for um, enforcing all kinds of different invariants uh, or guardrails or constraints or rules or whatever you want to call them over, over workloads, right? Over, you know, deployments and pods and ingresses and services and so on, right? So, um, you know, uh, anytime you want to, um, you know, roll out Kubernetes in a, in a large organization, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a possibly a heavily regulated um, industry, you know, you need to worry about, you know, where images are being sourced from, um, what labels are being applied, what teams can expose, you know, certain host names or paths or ingresses and so on. And OPA provides a really good um, solution to enforcing those kinds of policies. Um, at, the, at the project level or at the, you know, the, in terms of software that OPA actually provides, um, we, you know, the core thing is, is a declarative um, policy language that lets you um, express rules that answer, you know, questions like, can this user perform this action on this resource? Um, it, it comes in the form of a, of a Go library, basically, that's quite lightweight. Um, we have very few um, uh, source level dependencies. We have no, like, runtime dependencies. Um, and you can also run it basically as a daemon if, uh, if you're not embedding it in Go. And then the last thing that we also provide is, a, is sort of a suite of tooling that helps people author, or build, test, and debug their policies. So we provide things like a, an interactive shell that um, allows you to kind of experiment with, with policy. Um, we provide a test framework so you can write basically unit tests over your, over your policies. Um, 
We have IDE integrations with VS Code um, and so on. So we're really basically taking policy and treating it as, as code um, and providing all the building blocks you need in order to do that. Um, and then just in terms of background, we, we started the project actually in, in early 2016 at Styra, the company that I, that I work for. Um, and, and we joined the CNCF sandbox around March of last year, as, as Chris mentioned. And that, that, that uh, proposal was sponsored by Ken Owens uh, and Brian Grant. So are there, any, um, are there any questions just about OPA at a high level? I know that some people might not be familiar with it. I'm happy to just, um, if there's any kind of confusion around what OPA is, I'm happy to address that now, but otherwise I can, I can move on. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, so um, this is just a kind of a summary of, of some of the stats we've been tracking on the project. And we tried to show the kind of year over year um, uh, growth of the project. Um, obviously for the sort of canonical information, go check out the CNCF dev stats page um, or the project health page that they, that they build. That's got much more information, but we thought we'd just distill some of it here. Um, so in terms of contributions and commits to the project, um, we had about 480 commits over the last year compared to 410 uh, the year before. Um, and um, about 75% of those commits last year came from uh, Styra, 7% uh, from Chef, 5% from Cisco, and then about 14% from sort of a, a long tail of different, different users. So um, obviously the, the contributor base is relatively small to the project, um, but the, the trends are encouraging here, right? The year before it was like 93% um, Styra committing to the project. So we're, we're, we're pleased with that, um, that, that trend. In terms of actual contributors to the project, uh, it basically doubled year over year. Um, we started tracking the, the Docker Hub polls um, basically a year ago almost. And at the time there were around 80,000 um, of polls. Um, over the last year though, it's grown to about 480,000. And recently we see about 10,000 image polls per week for the project or for the, for the main OPA image. Um, we've seen a lot of growth um, on Slack over the last year. Um, almost 10x, we see about 15 people a week joining the, the Slack organization. Uh, so there are lots of people on Slack uh, asking questions about OPA, asking questions about policy and Kubernetes, um, and then just talking about their use cases uh, more generally that they, that they want to apply policy for. Um, recently, we started tracking the number of Rego files on GitHub. So these, this is an approximate number of the number of uh, repositories containing Rego files that are publicly accessible on GitHub. Um, so, so that's an that's an interesting metric, I think, um, and and we see about a couple we see a couple new repos every week, basically, um, popping up, and then in terms of stars, we we've seen quite a bit of growth there, almost like more than 10x. Um, that's due to a, a hacker news post actually that seemed to drive a lot of traffic to the project. In terms of the project itself and what we've been working on, um, there's a lot of there's a bunch of project level um, improvements we made. Uh, so. We started holding bi-weekly community meetings since we entered the sandbox. And um, lately we've had um, uh, quite a bit of good participation there. So we've had um, regulars from Cisco and other companies participating, um, which has been great. Um, we defined a governance model um, in order to, to, to meet this, the, the requirements of CNCF. Uh, we went through the, C, uh, the core infrastructure initiative uh, best practices badging process. Um, and so right now we're just passing. We haven't done the silver or gold um, uh, uh, levels, but we'll, maybe we'll look at that in the next year. Um, and then um, thanks to the CNCF, we were able to get uh, Cure 53, an external pen tester, to do a security audit of, of the project uh, in, in the summer, in August. And I think that that was relatively successful. Um, there were a few uh, uh, low criticality uh, vulnerabilities that they discovered, uh, and those got fixed. Um, so thanks to the CNCF for, for sponsoring that, um, and Cure 53 for doing a great job there. Um, in terms of actual feature development, uh, we shipped a lot of interesting things in the last year. Uh, we, we, uh, we added support for uh, basically a set of management APIs that allow you to dynamically configure OPA to do things like pull down policy and data from, from, a, from an external service API. Um, we added a, a support for having OPA report its status back to a control plane so you can see like what version of the policy the OPA is running with, um, whether there are any errors activating the, most, the, the, the latest policy bundle. And then also a, uh, a decision log endpoint so that OPA can basically periodically upload batches of um, policy decision or audit logs to, to a remote endpoint. And, and those are particularly useful for uh, debugging use cases, um, auditing, and, and other things. Um, uh, at the end of last year, we, we shipped 
uh, an initial version of a Rego to WebAssembly compiler. So that's, it's basically an alpha right now. We're still um, working on that. It's not feature complete yet. We haven't covered the entire language, um, but we expect that to complete in the next uh, couple months. And then hopefully towards the end of this year, we'll have some interesting use cases that we can show off around uh, using WebAssembly for policy enforcement. Uh, we also worked on a number of data filtering use cases. Um, as we found that a number of companies that were using OPA for API authorization, um, once they'd sort of solved API authorization with OPA, the next question they had was, well, how do I restrict access to sensitive data using OPA? And um, so we put a bunch of uh, effort into um, extending one of OPA's features called partial evaluation to enable um, translation from uh, basically Rego down into uh, other query languages like SQL and Elasticsearch. So um, there's, a, there's a blog post on that. Uh, I think it's interesting. It, it kind of shows how you can um, push policy enforcement down into the database or down into the data layer. Uh, we also added TLS uh, client authentication for connections to OPA. Uh, we had previously only supported bearer tokens there. Uh, we had uh, a couple end users ask for uh, TLS support and that was actually contributed by uh, some folks at Chef. And then we also added about 25 new built-in functions to, uh, to the language to do common things like decode and verify jots, um, perform you know, date time operations, uh, CIDR math. Uh, we added a bunch of glob functions that are useful for dealing with things like ARNs um, and so on. And, and, I, and I think most of those uh, came from the community. Um, that, was, that was largely driven by people you know, writing Rego and then thinking, oh, maybe there's some part of this that would be better expressed as a built-in and that they could contribute. Um, and so that was, that was nice to see. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to call out here are a few integrations that we, uh, that we built and that were also contributed uh, by the community over the last year. So we, we built an integration with uh, Envoy's external auth Z uh, feature so that you could enforce, uh, you know, API authorization policies, um, you know, with Envoy um, or in the Istio data plane, which complements the, the mixer integration that we already have. Um, we built a Ceph uh, object gateway um, integration that was uh, requested by one of our end users. Uh, the MinIO folks uh, built a similar integration with their object gateway. Um, somebody built a Flask integration. Flask is a popular um, Python uh, web framework. Uh, somebody built a Kong integration, and we also put together a Kafka one. Um, and then um, something bigger that we also kicked off uh, recently uh, was this new project called Gatekeeper. Um, so late last year, uh, we started talking with various folks from Microsoft, Google, and elsewhere about this problem of admission control and policy enforcement within Kubernetes. Um, and it turned out that they'd already been basically working on a project around um, that using OPA. Um, so the Azure folks contributed their uh, Azure Kubernetes policy controller project to the Open Policy Agent organization. Um, and what Gatekeeper, which we ran, uh, what, what it's called now is Gatekeeper. And um, what Gatekeeper, Gatekeeper basically does is it, it integrates OPA with Kubernetes um, in, a, in a more, um, kind of Kubernetes native manner than what we previously had just with OPA. Um, and by doing so, it enables basically flexible um, admission control policy enforcement and auditing of, of Kubernetes clusters. Um, so yeah, so we, we started working with various folks late last year, but we kind of only officially kicked it off in, in January um, with, a, with community meetings, basically weekly community meetings um, that are being led by, by Google, Microsoft, and, and Styra. Uh, we also have others contributing to that. Um, and we have a number of end user participants that are, that are engaged in those meetings. So um, yeah, Craig from Commonwealth Bank of Australia, folks from Replicated HQ, Capital One, Intuit, um, Red Hat, and others are all participating in those meetings. Um, so that's been, that's been going super well. In terms of the actual project, like what we were aiming to provide, the MVP has sort of three main things that we want to deliver. Um, the first is, is an audit capability. Um, so we want people to be able to take their admission policies and then ask the question, well, what um, what resources in my Kubernetes cluster are currently violating um, that admission policy, right? So like what resources are missing, uh, you know, a TTL annotation, right? Um, that's a super common use case. Um, we're also going to be providing uh, a standard library um, or a, of kind of canned policies for common use cases. So, um, you know, you hear people talking a lot about things like restricting image, um, the image registries that, that containers can get pulled from, um, or, you know, doing management of labels, like doing ACLs over, over labels, um, or restricting ingress um, paths and stuff like that. So um, there are a lot of these use cases that 
can be kind of distilled into templates or um, uh, standard canned examples. And so we're going to have a kind of a, an upstream community-based library of these policies. Um, and then in terms of the actual um, interaction with Kubernetes, we're going to move to a CRD model um, where you can basically load um, policies in via CRDs and then instantiate them as well via a CRD. Um, okay, so just sort of moving on to um, end user kind of um, reports. So um, this slide gives kind of an overview of who is using OPA today. Um, I don't think it's complete. Uh, we, we had a booth at KubeCon actually, and uh, you know, we had people coming up to us from all kinds of different companies that we'd actually even never heard of, some of them, that were telling us that they'd been using OPA for various things, um, particularly uh, this problem of Kubernetes admission control. Um, so. I, th this is basically the, uh, a list of companies who we reached out to and who were able to publicly um, say that they were using the project right now. But obviously, given that OPA is kind of embedded in a, in a core part of a company's platform, um, some of them are not totally comfortable uh, saying that they're using it publicly. Um, so in terms of production usage, um, we, we have Intuit, Netflix, and Capital One highlighted here. If you want to know a lot more about their use cases, you can check out talks that we did at uh, KubeCon Austin uh, in 2017 with Netflix, uh, and then KubeCon Seattle in 2018 with uh, Intuit and Capital One. Um, and so I think we have a few slides coming up that just kind of explain some of these use cases. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so Netflix uh, was one of the earliest uh, adopters of the project. And um, for them, they, they use OPA as a kind of a core part of their security platform. So they have, a, they have an internal security platform that's responsible for enforcing access control across uh, microservices and other components in their infrastructure. Um, these, this environment is, is got a lot of heterogeneity in it, right? There it's, they've got services implemented in a variety of different languages and frameworks. You know that use different identity systems that are that have, have a different identity protocols around them um, that that speak different protocols on the wire and so on. Um, and these are you know they've got thousands of instances that they're that they're dealing with, right? And so today they're running OPA on on basically thousands of instances in their cloud infrastructure, and they're uh, they're leveraging OPA's ability to take in external information, external context, data from their from their organization to enforce enforce policies, right? So pulling in data from um, like it, uh, uh, CMDB, you know, like a config management database that has the application metadata in it, um, information from their, their um, employee, employee tracking systems and so on. Um, and they, they're, they're really, you know, leveraging that, that core functionality of OPA quite heavily. Um, they're also, you know, obviously leveraging OPA's ability to express policy over a wide variety of different um, uh, systems, right? So they're, they're implementing um, OPA policies over like HTTP APIs, gRPC APIs, Kafka, um, and other other things, right? So the, the fact that OPA provides a flexible and consistent way to do that is, is very important for them. Uh, next slide. Um, Chef is another company that's using OPA. Um, they're also using OPA for API authorization, but their use case is, is different because what they're doing is they're actually embedding it into <coughs> Chef Automate um, to provide uh, to provide basically you know authorization support to their end users. Um, so. This is, this is sort of that second use case that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, basically, they, they implement an IAM style access control model in Chef Automate um, on top of OPA. And then they're also using OPA to enumerate the user resource permissions um, in the product. And they're also leveraging one of OPA's more advanced features, uh, which is partial evaluation, to um, optimize the policies and, and reduce the evaluation time. Uh, next slide. Um, so, getting into some of the Kubernetes uh, related use cases, uh, Intuit. Um, is using OPA in production. They've got OPA deployed as a validating and mutating admission controller for different kinds of uh, security, multi-tenancy, and risk management policies. Um, they're currently deployed, they have OPA deployed across 50 different clusters um, with about a thousand, and it's enforcing policy across about a thousand namespaces um, in total. And, and like I mentioned, we, you can check out a talk that we did with them at uh, KubeCon Seattle um, that covers that, that, that use case. Um, uh, BOL.com is a is a um, out of the Netherlands, I believe. They're a, they're an online retailer. Um, again, using OPA for a mix of validating and mutating admission control um, policies in their Kubernetes clusters. So they they do things like they they patch you know image pull secrets onto onto pods. They they um, they set different load balancer properties and and tolerations. 
on workloads. Um, and all of that is based on context that's coming from metadata stored on namespaces. So they're basically replicating uh, namespace objects into OPA and then you're referring to those inside of their policies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that I think they're deployed across um, a number of different clusters. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to highlight is, is a company that ha can't publicly state that they're using OPA, but they're a Fortune 100 company. Um, they're very security um, focused. They, they use OPA for a mix of, um, or for, for a bunch of different validating and mission control use cases, as well as authorization policies within Kubernetes. Um, they've got about 10 clusters right now with over a thousand nodes. Um, what, what one of the things that was interesting there was that they, they initially adopted it for admission control in Kubernetes about a year ago. And over the past year, they've, they've, it's sort of spread out into a bunch of different use cases as they've, as they've seen that it can be applied um, to different technology, different domains. And so, for example, today they've got it integrated into their um, public key infrastructure um, in, a, in a certificate RA that's serving these clusters, right? So when workloads boot up and they request, you know, a client certificate or a service certificate, they, they have policies in place there that decide whether or not those, those certs get granted. So, um, th and that's, that's, that's it, I think. I think the next slide is just a uh, conclusion. Um, so yeah, so there's the so, slide. Uh, this, is, this is Anatoly, just have a quick question. Um, do you have a uh, API for the OPA that if somebody wants to integrate, that can integrate easily? Uh, so the question is, uh, do we have an API? Yes, we do. Um, there's a, a Go-based API you can use if you want to embed it as a library. And we also have an HTTP-based API um, that you can use for, for non-Go embeddings. Um, and so uh, that's, that's um, well supported and, and we have plenty of documentation and examples that show that. So the other one is uh, you're talking about the uh, admission control. Um, I don't know really what that means in your terminology. I assume that has nothing to do with the traffic. You're probably talking about the uh, the packaging and things like that. Am I wrong? Yeah, ad admission control is just a process of enforcing uh, different kind of like semantic validation or invariance over kube resources that are being created, updated, and, and deleted. Um, so it's it's a core part of Kubernetes, um, but it's it's a little bit um, obscure for some. Yeah, the admission control is used for completely different things. <laughs> but okay, thank you. Torin, I had a quick question about, um, uh, it's a bit difficult to formulate clearly, but to what extent is all these integrations available as open source? So. So if I was a user uh, and I wanted to enforce all these various different kinds of policies that you've mentioned, uh, what, to what extent can I do that using open source tools that are out there in integrations? And to what extent do I need to buy commercial integrations with OPA for that? Um, so we have about 20 integrations that are all open source uh, today. So um, a lot of them just leverage like external authorization capabilities that that other projects and products have, right? So, Kube has excellent, you know, external authorization capabilities. It's got an authorization webhook. It has admission webhooks. Um, we just plug into those basically. Um, you know, projects like Kafka, um, Ceph, and so on all have external authorization. We just hook into those. Um, so, so the answer is that they're basically all open source. Um, some of them are obviously less mature than others, um, uh, but but yeah. Okay, so, so most of these use cases that you've outlined, I could go out and install a bunch of open source software and, and do the same thing if I authored the correct policy. Awesome. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and we, what we see a lot of as well are people just building custom integrations internally um, based on their environments. So we yeah. try to make the API as simple as possible for people to integrate. Cool. Thank you, that answers my question. Hi, uh, quick question about uh, the Netflix uh, use case. Hello? Yep. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So one of the thing I, I saw that in their in their presentation was the fact that they do the aggregation of the policy information from all various uh, systems and then they do the distribution. So which is kind of very uh, interesting because we are looking at OPA from our edge cloud uh, perspective and we would we want to do the decisioning near to the edge actually. So is that something distribution thing is part of the OPA thing or is that something we will have to build it ourselves just like uh, Netflix uh, folks did? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That comes up all the time. Um, uh, there's no open source control plane for OPA that does the distribution that I know of today. Um, I mentioned a minute ago in the in the section of what we worked on in the last year, we added these these APIs that enable um, OPA to pull down policies for just like basically enable distribution, um, enable observability 
um, of OPAs. Um, so those APIs are there. So we have the APIs in place for you to build that, um, but you have to you have to build it yourself today. So you have to kind of everybody has to kind of custom build uh, the, as far as the distribution of the centralized policy DB is concerned. Yeah. Now to be to be fair, like one of the things that Netflix said was that that like the like the way that they architected that control plane and the way that they expose it to their to their users and their organization is very specific to their organization, right? Because they they have you know custom services that they're pulling data from and they have you know very specific UIs that they want to expose to their to their um, users within the company, and and so they didn't like they, I don't think they saw a lot of value in, in open sourcing that like it didn't seem like it would necessarily be reasonable. So we, we do see people building their like their own control plans. Um, fairly frequently. It's just because it's going to say that it ends up being specific to that org, but we'd love to see more people within the community working on that as well. If, if there's interest. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you uh, offline. Uh, Great. Yeah. Happy to chat offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Alexis just butting in to say, unfortunately I have to drop off the call in a minute. Um, I have two quick comments. One is that um, speaking personally, I have come across a lot of enterprise and users who are either using or talking about OPA which I think is extremely healthy and exciting. So well done. Um, secondly, on a process point of view, um, we haven't voted on incubation for some time. And there was some discussion about uh, formalizing the process a bit more. Um, I would like to ask Chris, if you could remind everybody in the TOC uh, where the process documents were written down. I think there was a long GitHub issue a while ago. Yeah. And it'd be good to just kind of make sure that we um, do things the same for every project, whether it's coming from the sandbox or coming in uh, a new, including DB. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. Thanks. Cool. No, no, no worries. I mean, essentially, uh, due deal, it's, it's all kind of in the sandbox <clears throat> markdown file, but um, there is a requirement for uh, due diligence and a two thirds uh, TOC uh, approval vote. So, uh, in this case, Brendan has volunteered to do a bit of due diligence, so it's on on his um, list to to take care of and share um, with the group, and then a formal vote will be called if there's really no objections from the TOC. Sound good, Alexis? Sounds good to me. Thank you very much, and, and goodbye, everybody, for now. Bye bye. Well, thanks. Um, any other questions for Torin um, about uh, OPA or any questions from the TOC members or concerns? Any movement or integrations around Cassandra? Um, not that I know of. We haven't built anything ourselves for that. Um, I do know one company that was using Cassandra for distribution of policy. To, to OPAs, but not like, not like for enforcement of policy. Um, did, yeah, happy to chat about that though. If that's if that's interesting. Great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, someone said in the Slack, does OPA support network and routing policy management as well, Torin? Um, <laughs> no, uh, I'm just going to say no right now. Yeah, you don't <laughs> want to put OPA in the data plane of your of your network. All right, final call for questions. Otherwise, um, we will uh, have <coughs> Brendan and the TOC kind of work on the kind of due diligence. And then after that's done, we'll call a formal vote, hopefully uh, in, in a week or two. Okay. Great. Yeah, uh, just uh, one last comment. Uh, Michael Payne here from JP Morgan. So we're, we're using OPA as well as part of our emission control uh, apparatus on Kubernetes, but we're also using it to enforce more restrictive network policy. So it's not in the data plane, but we are using it to um, further lock down our network denial network policy as well. So it's it's working out well for us. Cool. Appreciate, that. Appreciate that end user feedback, Michael. Yeah, I wanted to just clarify uh, Torrin's answer to the previous question, which I guess is similar to what Michael just mentioned. Uh, from what I recall, although you don't want to actually be like policing packets with uh, OPA evaluations, um, I, I understood that there were quite a few cases of uh, basically customizing things like IP tables rules based on OPA policy. So, so it wasn't directly in the data plane, but it, it was involved in programming the data plane. Is that true or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it is possible that you could use OPA to enforce policies in, in the network. Uh, we don't do that today. Like we just haven't invested effort into engineering that. Um, it's, a, it's a really big 
amount of effort that goes into that. And we just haven't done that yet. In theory, you could definitely take Opus policy language and express like micro segmentation policies um, and then have something that, that translates or compiles that down into IP tables or, or whatever um, to get enforced in the network in the data plane. So it's, it's definitely possible. And then there are there's other kinds of use cases that Michael just mentioned that, that they're using Opus for around putting guardrails over like uh, the, the actual network objects and the network policies. Um, and so on. So th there is definitely a, a network domain component here. I just didn't want to say that we're putting OPA, uh, you know, on every packet, which we're not doing right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks all. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks, Doran. All right. Um, moving on. So uh, another discussion topic. Uh, trying to remember if it was Quentin or Alexis that that brought this up, but essentially. Uh, the CNCF uh, launched a uh, new initiative similar to kind of the work that we do you know, around uh, dev stats or cncf.ci uh, and so on. But, you know, this essentially is a uh, joint collaboration with a sister foundation at the Linux Foundation called uh, LFN, which is the Linux Foundation networking folks. Uh, essentially, it's a lot of um, telcos, but uh, the name of the project is uh, the CNF testbed. So if you're familiar with the telco industry, um, there is a wide amount of usage of uh, VMs through these things called VNFs, which are essentially are little apps, um, you know, packaged uh, in VMs. Um, there's been a lot of desire amongst uh, certain CNCF uh, members and uh, LFN members to, you know, see how uh, kind of a modern take, uh, you know, on deploying uh, applications within telcos kind of look like, and you know, uh, trying to compare uh, infrastructure. Uh, deployments between, say, like a container-based stack versus a VM-based stack and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, the idea was to try to come up with a uh, simple re reproducible uh, environment for uh, folks to try out kind of both approaches and, you know, how it would look like and so on. Um, you know, we had some generous support from uh, one of our members' packet to provide some hardware, and then we <clears throat> funded some uh, kind of contractors kind of work on this um, uh, project. We I linked off a very detailed um, presentation that kind of dives in uh, into kind of the more specifics of, of what's uh, contained uh, in this initiative. But um, on the next slide, it kind of covers, uh, you know, more ways to kind of uh, get involved and in how to kind of play with this infrastructure, essentially, if you want to uh, take advantage of it and see how this would work for you. Uh, it's all kind of linked off the uh, CNF testbed. GitHub repo, and there's a way to request accounts uh, via uh, via packets. So uh, essentially, it's a bit of an experiment for us, uh, but it's uh, you know <clears throat> been going pretty well. Uh, we've been working on this, I think, for uh, probably past past nine plus nine plus months. So um, those are some of the details. Uh, you know, I try to remember if it was Alexis or Quinton who asked this, but you know, we're open to kind of any questions that. Uh, the TOC or the community has uh, on this uh, on this specific initiative, and I think Dan's on the line also if he wants to share any uh, specific uh, uh, feedback. Yeah, I, I was the one who asked to put this on the agenda, and sure. the main motivation was that I don't think that TOC was significantly aware of any of the work that was happening, and I also know there was a pretty contentious um, press release made. And uh, I think many of the TOC members and potentially the board members as well were surprised by this. Um, and so it seems like we need to have what some way of avoiding that surprise. <laughs> um, and yeah. Got, I got it, Quinton. I think it was brought up um, at, at a board meeting a while ago that we're funding um, this, but it looks like we didn't do the kind of best job of disseminating it to um, the TOC. Because the end, there are tools like, you know, API Snoop, CNCF, you know, .ci that CNCF funds that I think the TOC should be uh, aware of, but maybe we're not doing um, uh, the best job uh, about that. I think my biggest concern is that we're essentially setting up a a this or that zero sum game between uh, Kubernetes and the CNCF and the uh, and the OpenStack community, mm -hmm. and um, whether or not that's the intent, that's that's the way that this is playing out. And the in the similar efforts that you're talking about here, things like DevStats, like that's all internal facing. That's about us understanding our community, understanding what we're doing. Like we're not actually going out and 
throwing shade like purposefully or not on, on other open source communities. Um, and so I'm wondering how we're thinking about navigating that so that we can, we can have this be something that, you know, is constructive for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think know, oh, go ahead, um, yeah, I, I think one of my quotes in particular in the TechCrunch article was unhelpfully negative. And I, I am clear that avoiding negativity is important to the Kubernetes and the cloud native communities. The point of the CNF testbed is to avoid ad hominem comments and instead have an open source replicable way to discuss differences between BNF and CNF architectures. And uh, I think it's, it's relatively obvious that um, a lot of the biggest backers of Kubernetes are also um, huge backers of OpenStack and a ton of the end users of cloud native projects are, are end users of OpenStack and uh, that there's a huge overlap of the community of developers and contributors and such and that we're going to be coexisting for years or probably decades to come. So I, I do uh, understand the point about negativity and I, I do regret that, that particular quote. Um, but I, I believe this can remain a, a useful project for looking at this particular uh, market development opportunity around telcos. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, there's also a larger message here outside of just the, the, the telco use cases, which is one of containers versus VMs. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated, ever-changing and fuzzy boundary between these things. And, and I think, you know, we very much want to make sure that uh, we look at it as containers and VMs, you know, horses for courses, right solution for the right problem type of thing. And I, and I think that that, uh, that didn't come out of some of, the, some of the press around this. I agree. Any other <clears throat> questions? Um, it's a fairly new initiative. Um, they're essentially running kind of like a typical open source projects with open meetings and so on. So if, if folks are interested, they're, they're more than happy to, to jump on. I believe they had a meeting um, yesterday. So um, I'll, send, I'll send a note out to the list of, if people are interested in engaging um, with, <clears throat> with that community. Alrighty. Um, any other uh, questions uh, from the community? Otherwise, we will see uh, uh, each other uh, next Tuesday, where we will be kicking off uh, project presentations um, and so on at 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific. So, um, any other questions before we wrap it up? Cool. All right. We'll close the meeting a few minutes early. So thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and um, uh, see everyone next week. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs>